and I'm from the University of Utah, and I'll be talking about how we can get control flow analysis with perfect stack precision for free. My collaborators in this were Stephen Lyde, Michael Adams, Matthew Might, and David Van Horn. So this won't be in your program, but I'd like to make a little last minute change to the title of the talk and call it Push Down CFA for Free for Free. And this is because we actually get uh, the benefit of our technique for free in two different senses. So a central challenge in static analysis is that we normally have to compromise between either getting good precision or getting a low cost of analysis. Getting both is hard, and getting a guarantee for both is even harder. But the technique that we present in our paper is actually one of the rarer cases where we can get the best of both worlds. We get a certain form of perfect precision and we get it at no additional cost in two different senses. So the first sense is in terms of computation or the algorithmic complexity, and the second sense is in terms of development. So this second sense in which we say our analysis technique can be had for free uh, is probably best illustrated visually. Here we have a, an imprecise analysis, which is implemented in Racket, and if we zoom in, we can see the one and only line of code that we need to change to apply, apply our technique. So this is a continuation allocator, and so it's just a function that takes some information about a certain semantic transition, and then it gives us back a continuation address. And the only thing we need to do to implement our technique in its totality is to make a small change to the return value of this function. So that's it. And so then the bulk of our paper is just in exploring how and why this actually works and how it ended up being so simple. So to be more specific, we describe a technique for static analysis which gives a guarantee of perfect stack precision. And so what this means is no loss of precision with regard to the structure of the stack, which stack frames might sit on top of which other stack frames. So if you can imagine a static analysis which would deal exclusively in terms of whole unbounded stacks, such an analysis would likely be incomputable because stacks could grow without bound. Uh, but even if the information inside a stack frame is approximate, it would still not permit any loss of precision in the structure of the stack, which stack frames can return to which other stack frames. And so this is the sense in which we say our analysis will guarantee perfect stack precision. And this is also how we formalize the idea of perfect stack precision in our paper. So what does perfect stack precision get you? Well, basically it gets you a guarantee of perfect return flows, even in a higher order setting. I'll explain more about what this means. Our technique is also free in two distinct senses. So first, it will exhibit no asymptotic complexity overhead. So that means if your underlying analysis is in a, perf in a, is in a specific complexity class with regard to its model size or its runtime, then after applying our technique, you're gonna have an analysis that's in the same complexity class. And it's also free in the sense that for analysis frameworks which use the approach of store allocating their continuations, then we also have no development overhead. And I should qualify this by reminding you that as we just saw, of course there will be a trivial change that's required in the code, but it's not gonna be a systemic change that will have an impact on the design of the analysis as a whole, and it's really not gonna have any impact on the problems of code maintainability going forward. So this is the sense in which we mean that it has no development overhead. So the approach that we use is one of abstracting abstract machines. And an abstract machine is basically just a conceptual machine which uh, allows us to model the semantics of a programming language. And uh, it's very flexible because basically it gives us free reign to uh, encode program states as mathematical objects however we want. So that makes it particularly convenient. And the approach of abstracting abstract machines is that we first start with a concrete semantics which is encoded in an abstract machine and it exactly specifies how our language operates in terms of concrete states and concrete state transitions. And then we approximate this concrete semantics to obtain an abstract semantics, which is also encoded in terms of abstract machines, um, and which approximately defines the operation of our, of our, of our language uh, in terms of abstract states and abstract state transitions. So the key idea here is that we're trading away some precision but we're gaining a guarantee of computability, and normally a, a guarantee of efficiency as well. And then normally we'll want to use some kind of a conservative approximation or various conservative approximations so that at the end of the day we have some definite information about our program. We want to put, we want a, a strict bound on program behavior. 
So to make sure I can keep everybody on board, many of whom probably haven't seen this style of analysis before, um, I'm gonna give a lot of background. I'm gonna talk about abstract machines, and I'm gonna talk about turning these abstract machines into a static analysis. And then we'll talk about uh, polyvariance and how we can tune the precision of an analysis like this. And so I'll, I'll try to cover this before we get into uh, the central problem and solution of the paper. So for a functional language, a concrete machine might look like uh, this. It might have a, a control expression, a binding environment, a value store, and a, uh, and a continuation. And so to be a little bit more specific, this might be a, a, a let expression, and then the binding environment would then map the free variables of our let expression to addresses, and the value store, which is like a model of the heap, will map these addresses to uh, their respective values. And our continuation is just some precise model of the stack. And so then to simulate a semantics uh, that's done in this style, we put together a deterministic transition function. And this basically consumes a state like this, and then it does some small step of, of work, and it gives us back a succeeding state, or it halts. And so in this case, we might move inside the binding expression of our let form, and then also put a, uh, a let continuation frame on the top of our stack. And so armed with a semantics like this, we can evaluate our program just by taking it, wrapping it up in an initial state with an empty environment and an empty uh, stack. And then we can iterate our transition function uh, to, to, to enumerate all the states in our program. And of course, if our program wouldn't terminate, then an exact simulation of the program also isn't gonna terminate. And so this could run forever. So from here, we want to add some approximation so that we can gain computability and some information about our program. So we'll start with program values. So let's say our concrete evaluation can manipulate uh, exact integers. Well then, in our static analysis, we might replace these with an abstract value, int, that just stands in for all possible integers. But from here, we can add arbitrary amounts of nuance that we might want in our abstract value domain. So we could use a sign analysis that can sometimes differentiate between positive and negative integers. We can use an interval analysis. We could uh, model an upper bound on the number of bits required to represent the integer. We have lots of options here. And with these abstraction and concretization relationships for values and for the components of our machine, we can compose them together to get just such a relationship for concrete states and their abstract representatives. So given a precise state, we can approximate it to obtain a, a most precise abstract representative. But due to the role that approximation is playing in producing a static analysis, it's very likely that this abstract state stands in for multiple or even an infinite number of these states. And just as before, we probably have a rich lattice of different degrees, uh, different granularities of precision in our abstract domains. So now what do these uh, abstract states look like? Well, there's two major differences. The first is that imprecision has simultaneously led to conflation in the store and also to non-determinism in our transition relation, which is now a non-deterministic transition relation. And so here, if we had a variable f, which in a concrete evaluation of our program would have accumulated, would have been bound in the lifetime of the program to multiple different closures, well now we strictly accumulate these closures. And so here, f could be either one of two different closures of which are conflated in our store. And so imprecision has led to conflation in the store, but also to non-determinism in our transition relation because if we have a call site for f, that we need to conservatively approximate tr our transitions from this, we need two different successors. The other major difference is that we have to have some way of approximating uh, our stack. And so there's different options for this, but a particularly convenient one is to use the approach of store allocating continuations. And what this does is it says, let's make use of the relationality of our store and view the stack as a linked list and then thread it into the store. And so here, instead of a current continuation, which is modeled as a stack, we have a current continuation address, which points into our store, and for it we have a set of top stack frames, each with their respective subcontinuation addresses. And so if they didn't halt, these will also point back into the continuation store and give us yet a next set of top stack frames, and so on and so forth. So simultaneously here we can get both uh, genuine merging between frames and thus genuinely spurious continuations in our store, but we can also represent uh, infinitely tall stacks as cycles in the store. So to do a static analysis using an abstract semantics like this, we can take our precise state, abstract it, 
and then iterate our non-deterministic tra abstract transition relation on it. And if our address space is finite, then our, we know that this is eventually gonna terminate at a fixed point. And that'll look like a closed abstract transition graph. And the simulation property that we have here is basically that if we took our uh, precise evaluation and we lined up that concrete program trace next to this graph, then that trace would abstract to some path through the abstract transition graph. And so if our concrete, our concrete evaluation could have run forever, then there must be some cycle in this graph. And this simulation property for our static analysis as a whole is induced by a similar property for the transition relations themselves. And that says if we have a concrete transition and we have an abstract predecessor, then there must exist some abstract transition which comes off this abstract predecessor and which simulates our concrete transition. There could be other spurious abstract transitions, but there must at least be one sound one. And from here, we can lose as much precision as we want on that sound uh, transi abstract transition. And this would be like a sound widening of our transition relation. And an example of this will be the store widening we'll talk about in just a second. So what we've put together so far um, might fairly be called a naive analysis because it's kind of the minimum that we needed to do to get ourselves from, an, uh, from a concrete semantics to an abstract semantics that approximates our program and gives us a static analysis. Uh, but it actually has exponential complexity so far. And to see why, we can peel open one of these abstract states and we can see that there's some number of components and an entire store. And this entire store is a relation between addresses and values. And so as we strictly accumulate values in our store, we climb the store lattice. The store lattice is of a polynomial height in the size of the program, but the overall number of points in the lattice is an exponential in the size of the program. And so what this means is that if we nest our stores inside our states, then even though we're strictly accumulating values, we can strictly accumulate a binding one and then two along one path in our graph, and we could accumulate those same two bindings but in the reverse order, two and then one along another path in our graph. And so what this means is we can actually, in the worst case, end up exploring both sides of every diamond in the store lattice. So this is how we get an exponential blow up in complexity. And to fix this, we can use a form of widening that relaxes the relationship between the other components in our state and the store. Uh, and, or, or equivalently, we can do a coarser form of structural abstraction, which is basically pairs a control flow graph, which doesn't have stores in it, with a single global store, which we maintain as the least upper bound of all of the st uh, stores that we would see so far. And so this will end up over approximating all of the stores we would have in our naive analysis. And it's a genuine, uh, it, it, it leads to some genuine imprecision, but it's a very common technique and it's often reasonable imprecision in practice. Uh, and it does get us to a polynomial time analysis in the size of our program. So the last thing we need to talk about before we can get into the central problem and solution of the paper is how we can tune uh, these, and this kind of analysis to different precisions and different complexities using different strategies for the allocation of addresses. So we need to allocate a finite number of addresses, but there's lots of different ways we can do this. And one of the simplest such examples is the monovariant strategy for, for allocation of addresses. And so what this says is we have an allocator which can produce only one unique variant, one unique address, for each syntactic variable in our program. And so if we have a, if we're, if we have a function that's being asked to allocate an address for a syntactic variable x, then basically that function can just return to us that variable x as its address. And the repercussion of this is that if we would have had multiple uh, concrete bindings in our evaluation of the program, we now have those all over approximated as just one by just one abstract binding in our analysis. So at the end of the day, our analysis has one approximation for each variable in the program. And the corresponding continuation allocator for this allocates an address that's specific to the entry point of our function. And it's fair for us to call this the monovariant continuation allocator because if we were to first convert our program to continuation passing style, and then we were to use a monovariant value allocator, then we would get exactly this behavior. But from here, there's lots of other strategies we can use for more precise polyvariant allocation of addresses. So, and, and many of these different uh, polyvariant allocation strategies are instantiations of classical flavors of static analysis. So uh, an example would be the call sensitivity of one CFA. So a first order call sensitive uh, analysis can be instantiated here 
by returning an address that's unique to both the syntactic variable that we're, that we're allocating an address for and the last call site that, that, uh, that, that we pass through. And so basically we're differentiating our addresses based on a limited history of the call sites we've passed through. It's a little bit like doing a kind of inlining in the abstract. And so this gives us an opportunity for more precision, but also for more complexity. So now let's look at an example. Uh, here we have an identity function is bound to a variable ID, and then we pass the value true through our identity function and bind it to Y. Then we pass the value false through our identity function and bind it to Z. So in the monovariant case, what happens is we allocate the same address twice in both invocations of the identity function. So both the value true and false end up merging in this single address for X, and then both true and false flow out to both Y and Z. So we get imprecision across the board. But what happens if we use our call sensitive allocator? Well here, we have the value true flowing into X, but an address that's unique to the first call site. And then we have the value false flowing into X, but an address that's unique to the second call site. So we've kept the values separate. But what happened to our continuations? Well, we still allocated the same address for both of our continuations, unique only to the entry point of our function. So now we have merging between our continuations. And so what happens is the value true and false flow into X at separate addresses, but then each of them flow out to Y and Z, causing conflation between true and false in Y and Z. So a conflation of continuations has led directly to a conflation of return flows. So what some of you might be thinking now is that I've just created the exact problem that I set out to solve. I gave us a more precise value allocator, but I left us with an imprecise continuation allocator, and now I'm concerned that we had merging between continuations. But I think it's fair to ask, how might we improve the precision of our continuation allocator? And is there a general strategy for doing this? So what if we might want to be able to vary our value allocator down the road? Or what if we want to be able to do a refinement strategy on our value allocator? We want to be able to treat the value allocator as a black box and guarantee that our continua continuation allocator will always inherit the pr its precision. And you might think a, a good general strategy for this is simply to mimic the style of polyvariance used for the value allocator. So if we have a one call sensitive value allocator, can we just use a one call sensitive continuation allocator to always get perfect return flows? And it turns out we can't. But in our paper, we show that if you use an address for continuation which is unique to the entry point of the function that's receiving the continuation and its polyvariant uh, environment, then you always get uh, perfect stack precision. And I think the idea here is that our, our value allocator is producing polyvariant addresses, and all of those which are unique, which are relevant to the function at hand, are encoded in this environment. So if we differentiate our continuations based on this environment as well, we get perfect stacks. So let's look at our example again. Now we have two uh, addresses, both unique to the entry point of our function, but the first unique to an environment which is in turn unique to the first uh, call site, and the second which is unique to an environment that's in turn unique to the second call site. So now we keep our continuation separate and we get perfect return flows. True flows into X and then into Y, false flows into X and then into Z. And so visually, if we're to, if we're, if we have a call transition where we're allocating a continuation for Y, then basically we're bundling up our target state, the entry point of our function, and we're calling its expression and environment our address for our continuation. So now we have an entry point and this address and then we can flow through the body of the function where the environment and expression is changing, but the address just propagates through shallowly. Then at the bottom, we can precisely look up uh, our continuation or return point and make a precise return. And importantly for our complexity argument in the paper, notice that if you have an extra callee into this function, the exact same entry point, then that continuation can just be added to our continuation set, no propagation is needed, and it can immediately, it's immediately available at all the return points so the return transitions pop out. And it's perfectly okay for us to have intervening calls and returns in here as well, let me show that. So there's three papers that we directly build on top of in this, and the first is context-free approach to control flow analysis. This wasn't really designed with polyvariance or direct style languages in mind, uh, and it gives an exponential increase in, in complexity. And it does have additional uh, overhead encoding as well. Then there's push-down control flow analysis, PDCFA, this is a bit more flexible, but it also has, a, and it has a, a, a quadratic complexity overhead, but it also has a significant amount of extra complexity in the code. Then there's abstracting abstract control, or AAC, 
which doesn't require any, it only requires a trivial change to our code, like our technique does, but it has a more than quadratic increase in complexity. So in conclusion, uh, we've, we describe in our paper a technique for static analysis that guarantees perfect stack precision, and we have lots more details in there. We have a proof of the perfect precision of our analysis, and we've mechanized and verified this in talk. And then our technique also gives, guarantees only a constant factor of overhead, um, and we've implemented it in an existing framework written in Scala, and uh, we've tested it both against AAC and also against an imprecise analysis. And across the board, we saw smaller model sizes. So that might indicate that in practice, we will tend to see a constant factor that's less than one. And then for frameworks which use the approach of store allocating continuations, uh, the insights of our paper can be brought to bear for the very low cost of a trivial change to code. Thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions. What the f of n is. So, for example, in a in a monovariant um, okay. store widened case, it's cubic, um, and so our, after applying our technique, it'll still be cubic. But if you have a slight elaboration of your um, of your value allocator, and you have say an n to the sixth or an n to the fifth algorithm okay. based on allocating more addresses, then this will still give you that exact same complexity, and it'll ensure you have perfect return flows. So, can this be thought in into the context of Buchy pushdown systems, which are known to where you can compute their set of reachable states just as fast as for regular systems. In other words, the, the pushdown is very, you, you know, you can, you can do it exactly the same way and you get smaller uh, sets. So it seems like this is very, you're using uh, continuations for that, but I mean, I was thinking more of like uh, Tom's approach mm. of reachability. Um, in context-free languages, is that uh, can that be thought of or understood that, like that? Well, I, um, it seems like there might be a connection there for sure, but I'd have to think about it more. So okay. that sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think that's very related. Basically, the way that we're different. Can you repeat the question? Okay, so, right. So he's asking if the approach of using summaries um, is, uh, is related to this, and if in that approach you could also get uh, perfect stack precision. Um, and I think it is, it is very related. So the approach of summaries um, is, is basically very similar to our approach, except they don't describe it in terms of addresses necessarily, but basically we have a way of tuning the uh, differentiation of, of the abstractions that we use in our program, and then we're saying that we have a way of doing the same for continuations, which can mimic the strategy that we used for, uh, for quotienting our, our program values. Um, and so I think that it would be related, but I'd have to think about that some more. <laughs> 